Well, good morning, church. It's wonderful to see all of you this morning. Won't you guys stand with us? This morning, we are going to open up with our monthly memory verse, which is Galatians 2.20, and Beth Miller is going to lead us in that. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20. You want to repeat it with me? I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20. You want to pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray that we can live those words and just breathe them in. And we just pray for every person that is here today. We thank you for this beautiful day. And we lift up Joe to you. I just pray that you will speak through him and open our hearts and our minds to receive whatever it is you need to give us today. So we thank you and we love you. And it is in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's worship God in this place this morning.
it is by your stripes that we are healed. You've done so much for us. Please be with Joe as he preaches this morning. Help your word just be alive here. We thank you and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, Gate Church. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to see you guys. It's good to be here. My name is Joe Montgomery. My wife, Erin, and I have been uh, coming to the Gate for about a year. We're in the process of becoming members here. And uh, over the last few months, I've had uh, a great privilege of meeting with uh, Gary and Craig Wade. Uh, we meet almost every week to uh, take a look at the scripture that we're going to be talking about in the upcoming week. And, um, and my favorite part about that has just been friendship with those two guys. It's, it's been great to get to know them. Uh, but it's also uh, cool to see how they process scripture, how Gary prepares each week and his heart for the church. Uh, really cool opportunity for me. Uh, and, and occasionally I get to do this, which I really enjoy. I like the process of um, learning and, and thinking. And so those of you who have taught know you don't really understand something until you try to teach it. And then you find out everything you don't know. Um, so it's, it's been a cool experience for me. Today we come to uh, Philippians 2.14, which is, I'm pretty sure, the first verse I ever memorized against my will. Um, I was a uh, probably a three or four year old boy who didn't like to eat vegetables and didn't like to go to bed and didn't like to clean his room. And my mom would say, Joey, do everything without complaining or arguing, Philippians 2, 14. And if I was really in trouble, she would say, Josiah, that's my real name, do everything without complaining or arguing. Well, as a young boy, I had the attention span of, you know, a gnat, probably, um, three or four seconds, and so I had hundreds, maybe thousands of mini-sermons uh, from my mom growing up. Well, today, my mom is in the audience. <laughs> the tables have turned. <laughs> and now I get an opportunity to give uh, like a 30-minute dissertation on Philippians 2.14. <laughs> the Lord works in mysterious ways. So uh, I'm going to be in the NIV. That's what she always quoted to me. Um, and and uh, it's, it's a more familiar translation for me. If you want to turn there, it's Philippians 2, 14 through 18. Let me read that for you. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. And you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Uh, pray with me and then we will uh, jump into this. Father, I thank you again for this church. I uh, thank you for these people and uh, for the way you move in congregations and groups of people. The way you move through music and move our hearts. Um, I pray that you would speak through your word the things you want to say would come across loud and clear, and that Jesus would be lifted up in our hearts, in our minds, that we would uh, adore what you have done, and, and wonder at the mystery of the cross, uh, and that like we sang, we would be able to say as, as a church, hallelujah for the cross. Teach us what that means. Teach us this morning. Give us open ears and open hearts and open minds to receive what you have to say. In Jesus' name we pray. So this morning we get to this place where Paul says, do everything without grumbling or arguing. And if, if you've been here over the last couple weeks or if you're familiar with this book, this is kind of like a, it's a little bit jarring the first time you read this because, you know, if you were here two weeks ago, Gary talked about this, um, this hymn that's in Philippians 2, 6 through 11, this, this extremely eloquent, beautiful depiction of who Jesus is and what he did. He was... He was God incarnate. He was God, and he came to earth and took on flesh, and he became obedient to death on a cross. And then God exalted him and gave him a name above all names. And it, this this language just soars in Philippians two six through eleven. And then and then last week, if you were here, Gary talked about how what do we do with that? What do we do with the with this incredible thing that Jesus has done? How do we work it out? And Paul says, work out your salvation. God is working in you. And and so it, you know just just this incredible, here's what Jesus did, now here's what you should do, but then today we get to the place where it's like, okay, Paul gets specific. He's like, okay, so, so what does it really look like, Paul? And he goes, stop grumbling. <laughs> and if 
you're like me, you kind of, I mean, like I kind of want Paul to be like, now look at what Jesus has done. Now get out there and take the gospel to the world. You know, or go, go feed the hungry. Go clothe the naked. Go bring me the wicked, the, the broom of the wicked witch of the West, right? <laughs> a quest, a great cause. Come on, Paul. Look what Jesus has done now. Now get out there and don't grumble anymore. And it's kind of like, really grumbling? That's where you went? Uh, is it even that big a deal? Is, is grumbling even a, a sin? Um, not only that, but Paul says do everything without grumbling or arguing. Like, never grumble again. <laughs> How are you doing on that one? <laughs> right? You walk in there and think we're doing pretty good? Well, I want to look at I want to look at this grumbling thing and what Paul has to say about it. Um, just kind of talk about what it is, why it matters, and, and what we can do about it. I was um, I was looking this week online for sort of you know quotes or articles that have to do with grumbling. I found this from the New Yorker. The uh, the writer of the article said, uh, "Grumbling differs from complaining." It says a complaint begins with like a, with a specific. He doesn't say like. A complaint begins with a specific problem and ideally moves towards some definite resolution, but grumbling is looser, less defined. Grumblers need only a few small dissatisfactions to begin their grumblesome work. From there, one grumble leads naturally to the next. He says if complaining creates a crisis, grumbling creates an atmosphere. He says, when we complain, you know, it's usually about a specific problem, and it may even lead to a solution. There's a point to it, but, but grumbling isn't about finding a solution. Grumbling just creates an atmosphere. And you know what he's talking about? My guess is uh, a lot of you work in places where the, the atmosphere is grumbling. It's almost like if you have something nice to say, don't say it. <laughs> the rule here is we grumble, right? And then, you grumble about the work, grumble about the pay, grumble about the boss, whatever it is. Some of you grew up in families like that, or you're in families like that, where most of the conversation, most of the discourse is just this grumble, right? This just ground note of dissatisfaction. And man, if you spend much time on social media, it's like the gloves have come off, right? You talk about grumbling, it's like the engine of the internet. If you think I'm overstating it, here's my challenge to you. When you leave today, wherever you go, um, eavesdrop. <laughs> Listen to what the people around you are talking about and how often the conversation is just this kind of negative, this dissatisfaction, this grumble. I was, I was walking through an airport uh, a little, about a couple weeks ago thinking about this message and just kind of noticing as I passed what people were saying. And man, like three seconds here, three seconds there as you walk down the terminal and grumble. Just the, the people complaining about all kinds of stuff. And I thought to myself, man, I do that all the time. And here Paul says, do everything without grumbling or arguing. But it's worse than that. Because, uh, because grumbling is this, this, it's so small. It's, it's really hard to see. Like if it's, it's a really big deal, but it's so small that we can barely see it in ourselves. In fact, some of you are thinking about a person you know who grumbles a lot that none of you are thinking about yourself, right? The question is, can you see it in yourself? You know, C.S. Lewis, he's one of my favorite authors. He writes a lot about joy and a lot about grumbling. And we're in a letter that is just all about joy. Paul can't stop talking about joy, about rejoicing. He gets to it again at the end of this passage. C.S. Lewis says, as a Christian, the motivation for what we do, that sort of the engine of the Christian life is this joy, this this thing that God plants in our heart, this river of joy that grows and grows and becomes sort of in, 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 implacable. Circumstances can't do, can't stop it. We, we have this joy, delight in God and who he is. And, and C.S. Lewis says, if you want to stop that joy, and don't do the marquee sins, don't do like murder and theft and adultery, and you know, just grumble. C.S. Lewis says, if you want to stop joy in its tracks, just start grumbling. And he goes on to say that, that this grumbling attitude, if we, if we leave it unchecked in our heart, it grows and grows until it's just total misery. And he talks about it in terms of hell um, in a couple different places. Listen to this. It's kind of scary language. He says, he says hell, hell begins with a grumbling mood. Always 
Hell begins with a grumbling mood, always complaining, always blaming others, but you're still distinct from it. You may even criticize it in yourself and wish you could stop it. But there may come a day when you can do, no, do so no longer, and then there will be no you left to criticize the mood or even to enjoy it, but just the grumble itself going on forever like a machine. And he says this. He says, it's not so much a question of God sending us to hell, in every one of us, there is something growing that will be hell unless it is nipped in the bud. Are you a grumbler? I want to look at this passage where Paul, uh, Paul introduces to us in Philippians, at least, this idea of grumbling. He says, do everything without grumbling or arguing. And then he says this, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault and a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. This, this, this children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation, this is a quote that Paul is lifting right out of Deuteronomy 32. And so I want to go back to the Old Testament today and just talk about what happened in Deuteronomy and in Exodus that, that led to this song. So you need to understand that Paul is a Pharisee. He was a Pharisee. He, before Paul's conversion... Uh, he was a Jewish Pharisee, which means Paul probably had the first five books of the Bible memorized verbatim. And he spent most of his life studying them and unpacking them and debating about them and implementing them in his religious and national life. Uh, that's what Pharisees did. And so when Paul quotes Deuteronomy 32.5, I mean, he's going kind of home. His mind is going right back to that, that passage and the events that led to that passage. Um, kind of like if I said to you, man, I can't wait to get back to the land of the free and the home of the brave. Uh, everyone in here would go, nobody would say, where's that? Right? Because you've heard the Star Spangled Banner hundreds or thousands of times. So you know, land of the free, home of the brave is a reference to that song. Right? Well, Deuteronomy 32 is, is kind of like a national anthem of Israel. It's... Uh, in Deuteronomy 31, God says, Moses, I'm going to teach you a song, and then I want you to teach it to the Israelites, and I want them to sing it all the time. I want them to teach their kids and their kids' kids. This is going to become their song. And so in Deuteronomy 32, we have the, the song. And in verse 5, uh, Deuteronomy, 30, Deuteronomy 32, it actually says, They are corrupt and not his children. To their shame, they are a warped and crooked generation. And so Paul pulls this pulls this quote out of Deuteronomy 32, and this is referring to the Israelites in the desert. Remember the story of the Israelites wandering the desert? This is referring to them. This song that Moses teaches them says that they were not his children. They were a warped and crooked generation. And so Paul's mind is going right to Exodus 16 and 17, where the Israelites grumbled against God. And so I want to tell you that story because I think it illuminates this idea of grumbling so well. And I think this is where Paul's mind is as he's writing this passage, quoting from Deuteronomy. So the story begins all the way back for us this morning in Genesis 15. And picture this. It's a beautiful, uh, a beautiful dark night, clear sky, zero light pollution. <laughs> the sky is just brilliant, right, with stars. And God calls to Abraham and says, come out and look at the stars. Can you count them? And of course, Abraham can't count them. And God says, Abraham, I'm going to save the world through you and your descendants, and your descendants will be as numerous as the stars in the sky. It's like the foundational promise. God is about to launch a redemption project as Abraham looks up at the stars. And so the task starts rolling. But Abraham doesn't have a son. How's he going to, how's he going to, you know, fulfill this promise? Well, uh, miraculously, in their very late age, Abraham and his wife Sarah conceive and have Isaac, right, the son of the promise. And Isaac grows up and he marries Rebecca, and Rebecca have and Isaac have uh, Jacob and Esau, twins, right. And the promise is passed to Jacob. And Jacob grows up and, and he marries uh, Leah and Rachel, and they have twelve sons. And you can uh, Jacob actually changes his or his name becomes Israel later in the Bible, and that's where we get the name Israel and the Israelites from Jacob and his 12 sons become the 12 tribes of Israel but if you remember the story that 11 of the sons don't like Joseph because Joseph is the favorite son and so they turn on him one day and they beat him up and they sell him into slavery they sell him to a band of slave traders and they go home and tell Jacob your son's dead uh, he was attacked by wild animals and they mourn his loss and they think they'll never see him again well 
Joseph is taken by slave traders and ends up in Egypt, where um, he, he climbs the pyramid, figuratively speaking. <laughs> he, he climbs to the, the top of leadership in Egypt through a bizarre set of circumstances, and, and he ends up as Pharaoh's right-hand man, and now he's running the, the most powerful nation in the country, Egypt, at the time. And he has this vision that there's going to be a famine in the land, so he starts hoarding food, just storing as much food, as much grain as he possibly can for the next seven years, and then the famine hits. And the region is decimated, and nobody has anything to eat except Egypt. And so Joseph's brothers and his dad, they're starving to death, and they say, we gotta, we got to do something. Let's go to Egypt and see if we can get some grain. Never expecting to meet Joseph again. And they get there, and who's in charge? It's their little brother, Joseph. And uh, there's this really cool picture of, of forgiveness and reconciliation. And so they set up camp in Egypt. The family is saved, and they flourish there for several generations until a pharaoh comes to power who is threatened by the Israelites. And he, he turns on them, and by force he enslaves them. And now the Israelite <laughs> family, Jacob's family, that has now grown, becomes slaves. And for 400 years, God is essentially silent, and the nation grows the, the family grows to over a million people. 400 years. I mean, we've been a country for 250 years in the U.S. 400 years of slavery. Over a million people. And then one day, uh, a little boy named Moses is born. Right? You remember Moses? Uh, he's miraculously saved and by Pharaoh's daughter. He grows up in Pharaoh's palace. Uh, probably learns Hebrew and Egyptian. Probably can read and write hieroglyphics. Well educated there in Egypt. But he's still an Israelite. And one day uh, in his youth, he decides to lead a revolt. And he tries to lead them out of Egypt. And nobody follows him. And so now he's in trouble. So he bolts. And he spends the rest of his life, he thinks, in the wilderness. Uh, because he can't be in Egypt anymore. But then God enters. Right? And, and the story takes a big turn when God shows up, like it always does. And Moses sees God in a, in a burning bush. Remember that story? And he goes and God speaks to him. And God says, Moses, get your staff and go talk to Pharaoh. It's time, for, it's time for my people to come out of Egypt. And Moses takes his staff. And his staff, over and over, it plays this, this key role in the story. Moses goes into, into Egypt with his staff and, and does a, a series of, of ten plagues, right? Remember? And every time God says, Moses, take your staff and strike the Nile, and he does, and the, and the Nile becomes blood. He says, Moses, hold out your staff, and he does, and, and frogs swarm the, the, the nation. He says, Moses, strike the dust with your staff, and then, you know, lice and gnats come out of the dust. It's over and over. The, the staff is this instrument of God's justice and judgment and power, right? He works through Moses and his staff. And so Pharaoh won't let him go. They go through ten plagues, and finally after the tenth plague, Pharaoh says, fine, go, you can go. And the Israelites walk out of Egypt, over a million people, and they're on their way toward the desert, toward the Red Sea, and Pharaoh changes his mind and comes after them to re-enslave them, probably kill a lot of them, and they, they're trapped by the sea, and God, God says, Moses, hold out your staff, and he does, and the, the Red Sea parts. And the Bible says that they walk through the Red Sea on dry land with a wall of water on their left and right. And so they go through, and one last time, Moses holds out his staff, and the, the Pharaoh's army is following them, and the Red Sea closes in on them. And the world's most powerful army is destroyed in a moment, and not one sword has been lifted by the Israelites. Just the staff of Moses. And now, a million people are free. Yesterday they were slaves. Today they're free, with no threat from Pharaoh. And God is going before them in a, in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. I can't imagine what that looked like. Some of you have probably seen like artwork uh, that, that tries to depict it, but this brilliant manifestation of the presence of God leading them through the desert. And they're, they're a new nation. I mean, imagine this a million people who have been slaves all their life, and as far back as anyone can remember, they've been slaves. And suddenly they're, a, they're their own people. They got, I mean, what are they going to be, right? What's, what's going to happen? And so they go out into the desert in about two and a half months. They run out of food. And we get to Exodus 16 where they start to grumble. And they say, they actually say, is God among us? Is God with us? 
and they grumble against God and against Moses. And, and Moses says, God, I don't know what to do. They're, they're, the people are turning on me. And, and God says, uh, all right, I'm going to send manna. And so the next day they wake up and there's just there's bread everywhere, just all over the ground. The Israelites have as much bread as they can eat. And that evening, <laughs> quail come into the camp, just wander into the camp. And now they can have as much quail as they, as much meat as they want to eat. And God just miraculously provides for them. Not long after that, they start to run out. They start to run out of water in Exodus 17, and again they grumble. It's in there that the Israelites grumbled against God and against Moses, and they're getting ready to stone Moses. And they they said it would be better for us to be back in Egypt where we had food and water to spare. Is God is what is God doing? Is He among us or not? And so we come to Exodus 17, which which is definitely in Paul's mind as he's writing this letter about grumbling and arguing. But here's what I, I want to say before, we, before I tell the story of Exodus 17. There are, I know there are people in this room because I'm like this. That, that there are times when we go, and I just wish God would give me a sign. I just, I wish he would like reveal himself like in a big way and just help me out with this doubt and, and just eliminate questions, you know, just just put this thing to bed. Then God is real and he's here and he's with me. I mean, that would help me out so much, right? If God would just show up and answer the question. Uh, I understand that, but can I tell you that if you think that a sign from God would solve your problems with God, you don't understand your heart. I mean, here's, here's a million people and they have just walked through the most incredible sequence of miracles in the history of humanity, one after another after another. They, they walked through the Red Sea. And, and yes, you know, God, God, bread just miraculously appears on the ground every morning. And quail are hanging out in our camp. They're just hanging out. We can eat meat anytime we want. And, and, Oh, by the way, at any time, day or night, I can walk out of my tent and look in front of the camp, and there's this manifest presence of God. Hmm. And the moment <laughs> things start going in the wrong way to them, they grumble. <coughs> and they go, is God among us? Is he for us? Can we even trust him? What's he doing? Can you imagine that? I mean, some of you Christians, believers, uh, you like what God does for you, right? I like what God does for me. I want him to take care of me and take care of my family and, and do the things that, that I want him to do. But is your faith in him or is it in what you want him to do for you? I mean, is your faith in God or is your faith in your agenda for God? There's this place in John 6. It's, it's, it's pretty astounding. Jesus actually sort of reenacts the exodus some of the miracles of the Exodus, or it, it's more accurate to say the Exodus was foretelling the events of Jesus. But in John 6, there's, there's like over 10,000 people around Jesus, and they, they're out of food. And the disciples tell him, send them away, they've got to go eat, and he goes, let's feed them. And he takes, he takes a, a couple loaves of bread and a couple of fish, and he starts breaking it, and it multiplies. Most of you know the story. He feeds over 10,000 people, just miraculously. Now, for us, that's an awesome miracle. For a Jewish person at that time, their mind goes straight to this story in Exodus 16 and 17, where manna from heaven comes, a miraculous provision of bread. And so this crowd, man, they get pumped. Like, this is the guy. Let's make this guy king. Let's get this thing going. We know exactly what needs to happen next, right? Well, Jesus wants nothing to do with it. He walks away from, the, from this crowd that would enthrone him and follow him in battle against the oppressing Romans. So they go to look for him. The next day they find him, and, and they go, come on, you know, where'd you go? Let's go, let's do this thing. And Jesus turns to him, and he says, you're not coming after me because of who I am. You're coming after me because you're hungry and you want another meal. And you can't have me that way. I want you to hear this. Jesus turns to the disciples, and he says, you cannot bring your agenda to me. You cannot come to me and say, Jesus, here's what you need to do for me, and then we're all in, right? You come to him and you say, Lord, your agenda is the agenda. Whatever you want is what needs to happen. And Jesus starts to sort of preach that sermon, and they, they get upset, and they say, listen, Jesus, 
Moses gave our ancestors bread in the desert. What sign are you going to give us to show who you are? And Jesus says, I am the bread from heaven. I am the bread of life. I'm here in your midst. And guess what? The crowd grumbled. You read about it in John 6. They start to grumble. Toward the, end of the, toward the end of the passage, in verse 66, John says that from this time on, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. His disciples left. I mean, they, yesterday, he fed 10,000 people from a couple loaves of bread, and today, he won't do what they want him to do, and they turn and walk away, right? And then he looks at his, uh, his disciples, and he says, you do not want to leave too, do you? And listen to Peter's response. This is so good. Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Peter says, Lord, we're not going anywhere. We're not in this for what you can do for us. We've come to believe that you are the Holy One of God. Do you believe that? Have you come to believe that he's the Holy One of God? Because listen, everything hinges on that question. Who is this man, Jesus? And if he's God... You can't tell him what he has to do for you. You can't bring your agenda to him and say, Lord, I know what I need. I just need some help here, right? I just need you to help me out with a couple things outside my control. You come to him and you say, Lord, command me. Give me the agenda. You come to him like that or you don't come to him at all. Christianity is like that. It's an all or nothing thing. We come to him and we give ourselves to him. That's what it means to follow him. How do we know? I mean, it's a tough question. How do you know whether you're following him for, for what he can do for you or whether you've, you're just following him for him? Look at, look at what Paul says at the end of this passage. Verse 17, he says, Even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I'm glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. And essentially what Paul is saying here is I'm probably going to be beaten up definitely in prison and there's a good chance I'm going to be executed for Jesus and listen this is not Paul's agenda for Jesus but Paul says I still rejoice whatever comes I'm not in this for the circumstances he gives me I'm in this for him so even when the worst things come into my life I've got him I rejoice Paul has this this engine of joy at his center that isn't isn't touched by terrible circumstance. I mean, that stuff's still bad. But the joy doesn't change because Paul's not in this for what God can do for him. He's in this for Jesus, right? He's in this for, he says, Lord, command me. And so he rejoices in the midst of his suffering. <coughs> How do you know if you are in it for him or for you? Well, when bad things come into your life, what's your response? Is, is, there, this, is there this joy that... that comes from within that can face difficult circumstances, or is there just a grumble that goes, here we go again, God? Well, what do we do about it? In Exodus 17, the Israelites are grumbling, and things are getting out of hand, and it's getting so bad that they're ready to stone Moses. And, uh, and, and God goes to, Moses goes to God and says, Lord, what do I do? Uh, I, they're they're about to stone me. And God says, Moses, go get your staff. <laughs> you go, uh-oh. You know, God's about to do some business. Like, we're about to put the smack down, right? <laughs> and Moses goes and gets his staff, and, Moses, and God says, Moses, assemble the elders of the nation of Israel. Assemble the elders in front of this rock, and I will stand before you and the elders. And you need to know, this is like the critical point of the story. If when God says, I will stand before you, that's, that's language that doesn't, should never happen. In that culture, the inferior stands before the superior. So that the child stands before the parent. The, the slave stands before the master. The subject comes in and stands before the king. But God says, I'm going to stand before you. In other words, I'm going to put myself in the place of inferiority. The elders of Israel, it's basically a trial scene, and they're going to declare judgment on God. So picture this with me. Moses gets his staff. He tells the elders, meet me at the rock. And, and so they assemble, and nobody knows what's going to happen here. And, 
And all of a sudden, uh, you know, God shows up somehow on the rock. I don't know what this looked like, but you can imagine it. It was probably hard to look at. It was probably terrifying and exhilarating. And the elders are going, oh, no. <laughs> You're going across the line, right? Moses has his staff. God just showed up, and we might be in trouble here. And nobody knows what's going to happen, but Moses turns away from the elders. God, God tells him to strike the rock. And he takes the staff, he takes the rod of justice and judgment, and instead of striking the elders, which is what ought to happen, Moses turns and he, he smacks the rock. He crushes the rock with his rod. And out flows this river of water to feed the nation of Israel. It's an incredible story. About 1,500 years later, God was on trial again. This time in Jerusalem judge was a guy named Pontius Pilate. And Jesus stood before him and he was condemned and sentenced to death on a cross. But because of his death, we have life. And over and over, Jesus drew on this imagery from the Old Testament. In John 4, 14, he says, whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. In John 7, 37, he said, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. And whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. On a, on a day they crucified Jesus, uh, the soldiers gathered around and they, they mocked him. They, they just kind of, they, I don't know if it was fun, they were mocking him. They took a robe and they put it on put together a crown of thorns and they put it on his head. And then somebody said, go get a staff. And they put a staff in Jesus' hand and they, they knelt down and they pretended like they were worshiping him. But then one of the soldiers grabbed the staff and struck him. The Bible says again and again on the head. I mean, it, the imagery, this foretelling it happens in the Old Testament, this, this incredible thing that happened in Exodus 17. It ha it's all about Jesus, and it is replayed in technicolor in the gospel when Jesus dies. My friends, uh, I know what it is to have the grumble in your heart, this complaint against God that can come out in so many different ways against other people and against circumstances and all that. And if that's you, look at the cross. Look at what Jesus has done. Take a look at the rock that was smitten. And living water came forward. That's the gospel. That because he took the judgment, because he took the blow of wrath that we should have taken, we have life. We have, we have water in the desert. We have streams of joy from within. And, and if that's new to you, I encourage you to keep coming, keep looking at this thing. And Christians, if this is something that's familiar, man, come with me and let's stare at the cross. As a church, let's stare at the cross. As a church, let's hold up the cross to the people around us until the world understands what Jesus did for you and for me. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the cross. Like we sang about we sing hallelujah for the cross. I thank you for the stories of the Old Testament that, that tell the story of Jesus. I thank you for this incredible reality, this thing that changes everything. What does it mean that our God, the maker of everything, hung on a cross and died? I pray that that mystery, that marvel, would, would eclipse our view, that we just can't get it off our mind, that we have to pray, that we have to think, that we have to wonder. Who are you? What have you done? Lord, I pray for the people here who don't, who don't know um, what that means, who haven't, haven't believed or haven't accepted. I pray that, that you would stir their heart, that you would resonate something in their heart that they, they go, i got to know more. i got to know who this God is. For those of us who are familiar, I pray that this would not get the old news, that you would bring life again and again to the gospel until it changes our heart and melts us and makes us who you want us to be. 
Lord, I pray for this church. I pray that we would be a place where the cross is lifted up, where every person who knows about the gates says those are people with the cross. Those are, you go in there, you're going to hear about Jesus. You're going to find out what he's done. And I pray that, that, that you would shape this congregation around the sacrifice of your son. Lord, we love you. Pray your will be done in each one individually and in this, this group, this congregation. In Jesus' name we pray. Why don't you stand with us this morning as we just co close out and just sing this song, Hallelujah for the Cross.
great is the cross. Paul says in, uh, in verse 15 and 16 that when the grumbling stops, we become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. He says, then, then you will shine like stars among them. You will shine among them like stars in the sky. I mean, Paul's mind goes right back to the story of Abraham on a clear night sky. And he says, when this becomes true in your life, you join the restoration project. We become his children. We become stars in the sky. We become part of that promise to Abraham that God will save the world and has saved the world through Jesus. People will see you shine, not because you've got this moral thing worked out or you're a good little Christian or you've got a lot of willpower, but because there is a fountain of joy that is rooted in what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. Amen. And Paul says in 16, as you hold firmly to the word of life, that word is the same word that John uses in John 1.1. 1, 1. Paul's saying, hold on to Jesus and hold out Jesus to the world. And it, is that true of you today? Some of you, this is the first time you've heard this stuff. If this is your first time here or you've only been coming a couple times, grab one of these cards and fill it out if you want to want to get to know more of the church and keep coming. You picked a great time to start coming to the gate if you're new here because it's almost Easter. And we want to be centered on the cross year round, but at Easter we ratchet it up and we celebrate what Jesus has done on the cross. So keep coming and learn what this cross is all about. And those of you who have been around for a long time, and go back to the cross again and again. That wasn't the entry point to Christianity. That wasn't how you got in the door. That is all, Christianity is all about the cross. Start to finish, it's what Jesus has done for us. Got a couple announcements before we go. Um, next Sunday is fifth Sunday. So remember there's no nine o'clock service. There's just gonna be one service. We're all gonna get together at 10.30 in here. Um, invite you to bring a covered dish for, uh, for supper to follow the meal. Uh, next Saturday is man camp. Um, if you want to go to that, guys, there's a sign-up uh, outside, and if you sign up, you'll get information this week about uh, when and where to be to go to that. It's a day long. It's not too late. Sign up. Uh, ladies, the book club discussion is starting on a new book called Carry On by Lisa Fenn. Uh, now's the time to start reading, and you'll be meeting in May, on May 4th for brunch and a discussion. You can contact Melissa for more info. And lastly, uh, this Friday night, coming up, uh, we're going to do a night of worship. And these guys... I've been working to prep 15 songs. I think it's going to be awesome. I'm really looking forward to it. I invite you out for that. Uh, there's also going to be some food and a Chinese auction and some fundraising events for uh, where the, the funds that are raised go to stability and crisis. So uh, come out and join us for a night of worship. Hey, let me pray for us, and then, uh, then, we'll, then we'll dismiss. Father, we thank you. Lord, this, this incredible gospel woven through history, woven through scripture, filled in Jesus, it's, it's, it's almost too good to be true. I pray that we would see it that way, that we would see it as so good, and then amazed that it is true, that, that all you've done, that, that it would become this sort, of, this sort of marvel to us, this gem, this priceless thing that we can't get enough of, that we, we think of all the time. I thank you that we can be forgiven, that we can be welcomed into your family, that we can be made like stars in the sky, no matter of our past, no matter our faults, overcome it, not because we get there, but because you came here and died in our place. Help us to rest in you, to learn what that means, to make the center of our heart and the center of our church every day. Thank you. I pray you bless these guys on their way out. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.